A U.S. government body held a congressional briefing discussing ways to break up Russia as a country, to divide up Russia in the name of decolonization. Now, anyone who knows the most basic history about the United States can see that this is absolutely absurd. The United States was founded on genocide against indigenous nations, ethnic cleansing of indigenous peoples, slavery of millions of Africans. We're talking about a massive campaign of genocide and oppression. The U.S. is a settler colonial state, but the U.S. Congress is discussing ways to, to decolonize Russia, as they say. This is yet another example of U.S. imperialists trying to co-opt left-wing rhetoric to push the interests of the U.S. empire. And in this case, they're trying to exploit progressive-sounding rhetoric to call for balkanizing, carving up Washington's adversary, Russia. This is truly outlandish, and it is an incredible step. I mean, it, it really is extremely provocative, considering that right now the U.S. is waging a proxy war on Russia via Ukraine. I've done videos and articles and podcasts explaining how the conflict in Ukraine is a proxy war being waged by the U.S., by NATO, by the European Union against Russia. But we also now see clearly in public that U.S. government officials are discussing the possibility of carving up Russia as a country. I wrote an article about this over at Multipolarista.com, and this report is titled, U.S. Government Body Plots to Break Up Russia in Name of Decolonization. And I note that this government body, which I'll get to in a second, it's called the Helsinki Commission. This U.S. government body held a congressional briefing in which participants who are neoconservative activists and people who work at U.S. government-backed organizations, they urged the U.S. government to provide more support to separatist movements inside Russia and in the diaspora, and they proposed the independence of numerous republics of the Russian Federation. Now, Russia as a country is formally referred to as the Russian Federation. It has nearly two dozen republics that are part of the Russian Federation. So this congressional briefing proposed breaking up numerous Russian republics, including Chechnya, Tatarstan, and Dagestan. Those are three of the 22 republics in the Russian Federation. They also proposed other areas, including historic regions that no longer exist. They existed centuries ago, like Circassia. So these people are, are calling for breaking up parts of Russia that haven't existed for 200 years and saying, well, we need to decolonize Russia. Of course, this is a certain kind of so-called decolonization that just so happens to support U.S. imperialism. So it's actually neocolonialism in the name of decolonization. Truly a kind of post postmodern propaganda. Truly incredible. Now, I note in this article here that for a long time, neoconservative figures and imperialists in Washington have called for breaking up, carving up foreign countries. During the first Cold War, the CIA and other U.S. government agencies supported secessionist movements inside the Soviet Union. And then in the 1990s, NATO helped destroy the country of Yugoslavia. It no longer exists. It was destroyed as a country by NATO wars of aggression. And then finally, we know that the CIA has, for many decades, supported separatist movements in numerous Chinese regions, especially in Tibet. The Dalai Lama is a longtime CIA asset. And the CIA worked with, with armed extremists, armed separatist extremists in Tibet who were trying to overthrow the People's Republic of China and reinstall a feudal monarchy in Tibet. And then we also know that the that U.S. intelligence agencies and U.S. government cutouts like the National Endowment for Democracy and USAID have supported separatist movements in Xinjiang and Hong Kong, which are also parts of China. And quite openly, the U.S. government today is very clearly supporting separatist forces in Taiwan, which is also 
internationally recognized as part of China. And the U.S. government is constantly sending military equipment to Taiwan. The U.S. has troops, U.S. military officers in Taiwan training these separatist forces. So, of course, this U.S. goal of breaking up Russia is a tactic that has been used before against places like the Soviet Union and Yugoslavia. And, of course, the U.S. has continued these policies and wants to carry out the same policies against China. The U.S. goal is breaking up the People's Republic of China in order to destroy all of its, all of the, the countries that challenge its unipolar hegemony, all the countries that challenge the dictatorship of the U.S. empire. Now, I also note that after the overthrow of the USSR in 1991, the infamous neoconservative operative Dick Cheney, who would go on to become vice president under George W. Bush and an architect of the Iraq War. In the 1990s, he actually proposed breaking up Russia into several smaller countries. I have a separate article about this over at multipolarista.com titled XVP Dick Cheney confirmed U.S. goal is to break up Russia, not just USSR. And it, it, this article is based on quotes from a memoir by the former U.S. Defense Secretary Robert Gates, who wrote in his memoir, which is called Duty, Duty, Memoirs of a Secretary at War. Robert Gates wrote that, quote, when the Soviet Union was collapsing, that is overthrown by the U.S. in late 1991, Dick Cheney wanted to see the dismantlement not only of the Soviet Union and the Russian empire, that term again, empire, but of Russia itself. So this has been a goal of imperialists in Washington for many decades now, and they're stating it very clearly. They're no longer even pretending otherwise. So I note that another major figure in U.S. imperial strategy, the major U.S. imperial strategist and former national security advisor for President Jimmy Carter, Zbigniew Brzezinski, in 1997, he published an article in the elite Foreign Affairs magazine, which is the magazine of the Council on Foreign Relations, which is closely linked to the CIA and the State Department. It's basically, it's the link between Wall Street and the CIA. And in 1997, Brzezinski published an article in this elite magazine proposing to create a, quote, loosely confederated Russia composed of a European Russia, a Siberian Republic, and a Far Eastern Republic. So, what I'm getting at here is that for many decades, top U.S. government officials have talked privately in their inner circles and in elite magazines about breaking up Russia as a country. But now we're at such a point where the U.S. Congress is holding briefings publicly in the open discussing ways to break up Russia. And this happened on June 23rd. On June 23rd, the U.S. Commission on Security and Cooperation in Europe, known more commonly as the Helsinki Commission, it sponsored a congressional briefing titled Decolonizing Russia, a Moral and Strategic Imperative. Now, this commission claims to be independent of the U.S. government, but of course, it is a U.S. government agency and it was created and is overseen by Congress. So, it's like when the U.S. government claims that the National Endowment for Democracy, the NED, is supposedly independent. It is not independent. That is the marketing. That is the propaganda that they say to try to cover up for the nefarious activities carried out by this congressional commission. Here is a screenshot of the, this note on the website of the Helsinki Commission. Decolonization of Russia to be discussed at upcoming Helsinki Commission briefing. Here is the page at the official website of the Helsinki Commission. It's titled Decolonizing Russia, a Moral and Strategic Imperative. Here are the different people who participated. I'll get to them in a second. But I want to point out how absurd, absurd the U.S. government's description of this event is. It describes Russia's barbaric war on Ukraine and before that on Syria, Libya, 
Georgia, and Chechnya. First of all, Chechnya is part of Russia. And in the Second Chechen War, the U.S. government was supporting far-right Chechen extremists, Islamist extremists, who were closely linked to Al-Qaeda. So, second of all, the war in Georgia was started by Georgia. And this was admitted even in the New York Times. Back in 2008, it was Georgia that initiated the war. Third of all, Russia's war on Libya? What are they talking about? NATO, led by the U.S., France, Britain, and Canada, is the force that destroyed the central state of Libya in 2011. Still today, after 11 years, there is no central government in Libya. NATO destroyed Libya, but they're now accusing Russia of waging war on Libya. Imagine being this cynical and sociopathic. And then finally, them accusing the U.S. government attacking Russia for supposedly waging a, quote, barbaric war on Syria is preposterous. The U.S. government, apartheid Israel, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Turkey, a NATO member, those countries spent billions of dollars over a decade waging a brutal, dirty war to try to destroy the central government of Syria. Russia militarily intervened at the request of the internationally recognized government in Damascus. Syria's internationally recognized government that sits at the United Nations asked for Russia's support to prevent state collapse. The U.S. was trying to collapse Syria's state and turn it into a failed state in the heart of West Asia, just as the U.S. helped destroy the central state of Libya and collapsed this massive country in the heart of North Africa. So, I mean, this is one of the, this is just a beginning of the incredible hypocrisy of this U.S. government commission condemning Russia supposedly for colonialism and war. But anyway, let me continue here. So this, this, is, this, is, the, this is the briefing that was held. Now, here is a photo of a U.S. congressman who participated in this congressional briefing on decolonizing Russia. His name is Steve Cohen, and he's a Democrat representing Tennessee. He's the co-chair of the Helsinki Commission. He made incredible comments, basically saying that Russia is not a real country and it should be broken up. So here are the comments, just here's a selection of some of the ridiculous comments that this sitting U.S. congressman said in this briefing. As far as Russia's uh, inconsistencies, they often criticize us for being uh, uh, inconsistent and having uh, unique situations that may be distinct. Some of our foreign policy decisions and maybe some internal problems we've had over the years with civil rights, et cetera. But Russia certainly has uh, issues where they have, co in essence, colonized their own country. It's not a strict uh, uh, nation in, in the sense that we've known it in the past, and, and we need to be concerned about the, the people in Tartarstan, in Baradia, and in the Far East and other areas, and, and to just show the inconsistency that Russia has. And it's not just what they want to do with Ukraine and, and, and Georgia and Chesnia. That's clear examples, but there are other examples. So we have this video because this congressional briefing was live streamed on YouTube, and you can find the link to it in my report at multipolarista.com. So joining this sitting U.S. congressman in this congressional briefing were a bunch of U.S. government employees and neoconservatives. The event was moderated by this anti-Russia activist named Bakhti Nishanov, who is a policy advisor to the Commission on Security and Cooperation in Europe, this U.S. government body. And he, he said very excitedly that this is a record for House briefings, that we've ha we have many, many participants, he boasted. So here are a few comments that he made in this briefing. Today's discussion is not a mere brain stimulating, yet largely esoteric exercise in a lip service to a zeitgeisty topic. It's also not an effort to be controversial or edgy just for the sake of likes and retweets. Today is a discussion to look at the fundamental foundational reasons for Russia's aggressive and brutal foreign policy that is leaving innocent people dead displaced and hurt in ways difficult to imagine. 
Understanding those reasons will help us craft policies and come up with ideas that will actually contain Russia. Russia's barbaric war in Ukraine has exposed the Russian Federation's viciously imperial character, something that has been apparent to an acute observer for some time, but now it's apparent to the entire world. Let me make it clear. Ukraine is not the first, and if left unchecked, it won't be the last instance of this. Russia has for decades, decades now waged wars on people of Chechnya, Syria, Georgia. This aggression also is catalyzing a long overdue conversation about Russia's interior empire. But it is after the start of Russia's war in Ukraine that serious discussions are now underway about reckoning with Russia's imperialism and the need to colonize Russia for it to become a viable stakeholder in European security and stability. Now, as I note in this report, the most active speaker in the hearing was a neoconservative activist named Casey Michelle. He's a millennial regime change operative. Now, this guy, he's made his entire career out of advocating for regime change against Washington's official enemies with a capital O and a capital E. He got his start working for U.S. Peace Corps on the Russia-Kazakhstan border. Not at all shady. N not, nothing shady going on there in Kazakhstan on the Russia border being done by U.S. Peace Corps, who definitely have no links whatsoever to U.S. intelligence agencies. Don't worry. Peace Corps always reassures us it has no ties to U.S. intelligence agencies. So clearly, nothing to worry about there. So after getting his start working in Kazakhstan for U.S. Peace Corps on the Russia border, he began working for a bunch of neoconservative think tanks in Washington, capitalizing on the new Cold War. He is now an adjunct fellow at an insanely named think, uh, organization at the right-wing think tank, the Hudson Institute. This is a neoconservative think tank in Washington. He works at something hilariously called the Kleptocracy Initiative. And the irony is that this neo neocon think tank, the Hudson Institute, which has a revolving door with the U.S. government and the Republican Party, they have a, an, a kleptocracy initiative. Meanwhile, they are an example of kleptocracy. Who funds the Hudson Institute? Right-wing billionaire oligarchs like the Kochs, the Koch family, the, the dynasty behind Walmart, the Walton family, massive corporations like ExxonMobil and Monsanto, and then the Pentagon also funds the Hudson Institute. So this guy is a millennial neocon. He represents the new generation of, you know, Robert Kagan and Bill Kristol and all those war criminal neocons. And he's the new 2.0 generation. And he is working at this neocon think tank funded by oligarchs and big corporations and the U.S. military. And he sits around and writes articles plotting new ways to destabilize Washington's adversaries, including by carving up Russia. He published an article in the Washington establishment magazine, The Atlantic, and it's titled Decolonize Russia. He published that in May, and it, it looks like that was the inspiration for this congressional briefing. And he was by far the most vocal speaker in this congressional briefing. Now, I'm going to play a few clips of what he said of his comments in the briefing. You know, I, I guess I want to just outline on, on my end, speaking as an American, uh, the broader history of U.S. policy, or perhaps lack thereof, as it pertains to the kinds of indigenous and anti-colonial movements within Russia. I know Representative Cohen just outlined some of the non-Russian nations that are still considered part of Russia proper. These are colonized nations that we consider to be part of Russia proper, even though, again, these are non-Russian nations themselves that remain colonized by, as we've seen yet again, another dictatorship in the Kremlin. Russia continues to oversee what is in many ways a traditional European empire, only that instead of colonizing nations and peoples overseas, it instead colonized nations and peoples over land. That is to say, Russia didn't create a transoceanic empire of colonized nations, but a transcontinental empire of colonized nations. Russia remains the only European empire that has never come close to fully decolonizing. It's the only European country that hasn't come anywhere close to fully recognizing, uh, reckoning uh, with its colonial history. Now, in this briefing, Casey Michelle claimed 
that the event was not about dismemberment or partition of Russia, but rather decolonization. I mean, I certainly think at the outset, there's this ongoing confusion, some in good faith, some in bad faith, that the notion of decolonization, especially as it pertains to Russia, is uh, simply a camouflage for dismemberment and partition, which it is absolutely not whatsoever. Now, this is ridiculous, obviously, because one, we know that this is just a cynical exercise in co-opting progressive sounding rhetoric to advance the interests of the U.S. empire and breaking up Russia, which is what these hawks in Washington have wanted for many decades. But it's also incredibly ironic because Casey Michel, this neocon, has spent years viciously attacking the anti-imperialist left. That's all he does. He's an attack dog who exists as a millennial neocon to go and attack young anti-imperialists on the left. He's an attack dog for Washington. And you can see some of his tweets here. The only time he's ever mentioned anti-imperialist is in scare quotes to attack actual anti-imperialists. So here he attacks Evo Morales in Bolivia. He attacks Nicolás Maduro in Venezuela, North Korea, Belarus, Syria, Cuba. So he's a complete neocon. He's not an anti-imperialist. He is an imperialist. He is an arc imperialist. He is a hyper ultra imperialist. He constantly attacks. Here's he, he's attacking Cuba with anti-imperialist and scare quotes. Cuba is the most anti-imperialist country on earth. The most consistent anti-imperialist country on earth. It is a model for anti-imperialism anywhere. And of course, he puts anti-imperialist Cuba in scare quotes because he's a neocon who supports U.S. imperialism. Every time he says anti-imperialist, it's in scare quotes. This guy is a neocon imperialist, but he's now trying to co-op anti-imperialist rhetoric to advance the interests of the U.S. empire. This is an extremely cynical operation. Here's a quote po posted by the official Twitter account of the U.S. government's Helsinki Commission saying, quoting Michelle, Casey Michelle saying, choosing to ignore the kinds of anti-colonial, pro-sovereignty, and anti-imperialist movements that will emerge in Russia is a luxury we no longer have. So pretending like they support anti-imperialism, I mean, ridiculous nonsense. Now let's look at some of the other people who participated in this panel on so-called decolonization of Russia, that is breaking up Russia. Another person was Erika Murat, who is a professor at the College of International Security Affairs at the Pentagon's National Defense University. So she works for the Pentagon. She accused Russia of committing genocide, and ironically, she condemned so-called imperial collaborators in Russia, singing out, singling out, in particular, the leader of Chechnya, which is part of Russia, Ramzan Kadyrov. Now, as I know in the article, she did not acknowledge the incongruity, that is the hypocrisy, that she's accusing ethnic minorities in Russia of being imperial collaborators when she herself is a collaborator with the empire. She works for the Pentagon. She is collaborating with the most violent, murderous, criminal empire on earth, the U.S. government, the U.S. military. She also attacked the global south. So here, I'm going to play this clip because it's ridiculous. I think uh, one other area, in addition to discussing Western scholarship, I think we should also engage the global south, why the global south con continues to consider Russia as uh, anti-Western, anti-colonial power and denies the dignity of non-Russian uh, people and especially people of color from the former Soviet space. Um, that's uh, And we, we see implication of these attitudes now and how um, the global south is reluctant in supporting Ukraine. So these are the kind of condescending comments we saw from some of these panelists attacking the global south for daring to oppose colonialism and imperialism and associating colonialism and imperialism with the colonialists and imperialists in the West who colonized them and still are attacking their sovereignty and imposing sanctions on them and imposing neoliberal structural adjustment and odious debt. Now, here are the comments from another panelist who participated in this congressional briefing named Botakos Kasimbekova. She also criticized the global south and complained about the anti-imperialist narrative 
of the Soviet Union that colonialism is associated with the colonialist West. Here are some of her comments. It has to do something with um, kind of the narrative that the uh, uh, Soviet Union created, and that is the narrative of imperial innocence. The Soviet Union blamed the West uh, and it's only Western um, uh, empires that were colonial, but the Soviet Union was a liberating force. And because this idea, this narrative was very attractive, especially in um, uh, uh, the global South, um, this propaganda uh, was um, allowed to oversee the colonial dimensions of the Soviet uh, Union. So um, it, it has to do with the narrative and it has to do with this kind of idea that it was that only capitalism, only the, the whole idea also uh, has to do with kind of with the Marxian idea that was popular all around the world, that capitalism produces colonialism, whereas social, socialism liberates. Now, I noted in this article that there is a major irony in her comments there because she admitted that after the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917, the former Russian Tsarist Empire, quote, partially underwent decolonization. The Soviet Union was the largest land empire here of the Russian colonial empire, which only partially underwent decolonization. So she is undermining the entire point of the panel, admitting that the Soviets, the, the revolutionary socialists, they decolonized Russia through the revolutionary process of creating the Soviet Union, which respected the sovereignty and self-determination of the 15 constituent republics in the Soviet Union, in the Central Asian republics, in Armenia, Azerbaijan. Those countries, those republics in the Soviet Union had their own sovereignty. They were not colonies. They were part of a federation of the Soviet Union but they had their own self-determination. So she accidentally undermined the entire point, the entire propaganda narrative of this U.S. congressional briefing by admitting that the Bolsheviks decolonized. Although, of course, she claims that the Soviet Union was another kind of empire, blah, 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 this kind of ridiculous propaganda. Now, the another ridiculous irony is that she constantly talked about Stalinism, 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 right? It's their, their favorite talking point, Stalinism. And she, she called for more thorough de-Stalinization. Of course, not mentioning that Nikolai Khrushchev, Khrushchev decolonized the Soviet Union back in the 1950s, starting in 1953. But okay, she, she claims that it was not de-Stalinized enough. The irony is that Joseph Stalin himself was not Russian. He was Georgian. He was from Georgia. So she's complaining that the most famous Russian leader in history, Stalin, who was not Russian, who was Georgian, supposedly was overseeing Russian colonialism against ethnic minorities. He was an ethnic minority. I mean, once again, we see the ridiculous propaganda in this very panel, this very congressional briefing, their own speakers undermine the ridiculous propaganda narrative. But anyway, she called for the U.S. government to increase support for secessionist movements in the name of so-called civil society. I'll play that clip here. It also means decentering Russia as the main player in the former Soviet space by supporting civic initiatives and civil societies of its neighbors and within Russia. Civil societies and the civic spirit based on the political understanding of a nation, as the case of Ukraine has shown again in 2022, is a key precondition for the struggle for decolonial freedom and justice. Here we see another ridiculous tweet from the U.S. government's Helsinki Commission claiming that Russia is attempting to restore the Soviet empire. First of all, the Soviet Union was not an empire, but Russia is not trying to restore the Soviet Union. I mean... The Russian government is capitalist, but based on genocidal suppression of peoples. Once again, we see the U.S. government constantly watering down the concept of genocide, which is a very real crime happening in Yemen, in Palestine. What the U.S. is doing in multiple countries is borderline genocidal with the sanctions starving people in Syria. But no, just blame Russia and China and all the big bag bo boogeymen. Ridiculous. Finally, there was another panelist named Fatima Tlis, 
who is a Circassian separatist activist from Russia. She, once again, has been funded by the U.S. government. She was given a fellowship by the National Endowment for Democracy, which is a CIA cutout used to fund regime change organizations around the world. She's also worked with numerous U.S. government propaganda outlets, including Voice of America and Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty. Those are propaganda outlets created by the CIA. And according to her LinkedIn profile that I reviewed, she has also worked with the Jamestown Foundation, which is a neo neocon think tank in D.C. that is very closely linked to the CIA. She claimed that her, her homeland, Circassia, is, quote, occupied by Russia. Now, yes, the Russian Tsarist Empire 200 years ago committed many horrible atrocities, and the Soviet Union overthrew the Russian Tsarist Empire and decolonized Russia through a socialist revolution. So she's calling for going back 200 years and carving up Russia. And, by the way, in this briefing she used the she talked about white slavery i'm not joking here's the clip she talked about white slavery now please go google white slavery the first word which is going to come up is circassians the circassians were sold in thousands on the slave markets in the ottoman empire by russia now, if you've ever heard the term white slavery, you know it's almost always used by white supremacists. I'm not, I'm not in any way accusing her of being a white supremacist, but I'm showing you that these are, the, these are the talking points we're dealing with. They are borrowing rhetoric from white supremacists and Nazis who talk about white slavery. Incredible. Incredible. And here's another moment that's ridiculous. In the hearing, surprisingly, I'll give them a little bit of credit the only credit they really deserve. They were given a, a critical question by Don DeBar, who's a, a great independent left-wing journalist. And they actually read, the, they read the, the question. And that question was, how can people working for the U.S. government in the United States talk about decolonizing Russia when their country was founded on the massive genocide of indigenous nations in the modern day United States? I think this is, um, and this is a critical question, but I think it's an important question. So marveling at the spectacle of the US government founded upon a genocide without a parallel in human history and sitting upon internal colonies of the remains of that genocide and the descendants of slaves were perhaps 1,000 military bases occupying the bulk of the planet and conducting a war on Russia's borders holding this discussion. Um, and, 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 and it's a Don DeBar, and if you would like a response to this, do we have a moral authority to be even talking about this? And how did these panelists respond to this very good question about the incredible colonialist hypocrisy of the U.S. government? They claim that it's Russian disinformation and whataboutism. Incredible. Here's the response from U.S. government-funded propagandist Fatima Talis. As for your question, everybody who has ever dealt with the uh, Russian disinformation and propaganda would immediately recognize it for what it is it's called uh, you know there's actually a professional term for it in this information whatabolism and she wasn't the only one who tried to downplay the genocide that the united states committed and still is committing against indigenous nations another panelist which is kasim bakova she also downplayed u.s colonialism and said that, that russia needs to stop blaming the west so uh, very quickly um, on the question with the U.S., uh, again, I agree that this is kind of a very typical way of blaming the West um, rather than looking inward. Now, I'll say there was one other panelist who participated in this congressional briefing. Her name is Hanna Hopko. She's a former member of Ukraine's parliament, and she previously chaired the Foreign Affairs Committee of Ukraine's parliament. She was a very significant figure in the 2014 U.S.-sponsored coup in Ukraine, which is, you know, marketed in propaganda as so-called Euromaidan. But because she was traveling and she was using her phone, the signal was very weak and she wasn't really able to speak that much in the briefing. Most of her comments were not really intelligible. But she did say one comment that once again shows that this is all about breaking up Russia. Again, this is a former senior member of Ukraine's parliament. 
She insisted that the U.S. government must think, quote, how to change not just the regime, but how to change the imperialist nature, imperialistic nature of Russian statehood. We have to learn lessons and uh, please do not to be afraid uh, of uh, strategically um, approaching with the uh, great um, approach and how to uh, change not just the regime, but how to change the imperialistic uh, nature of Russian statehood. So here she's calling for the U.S. to challenge the very nature of Russian statehood, that is, break up Russia as a state. Now, finally, I want to point out, I mean, I talked about this earlier, the ridiculous hypocrisy of them accusing Russia of so-called imperialism in Syria, a country that the U.S. military right now is still occupying illegally with hundreds of troops in Syria's oil and wheat rich regions, starving the central government of Syria of revenue that it needs to rebuild. This is the incredible hypocrisy. Meanwhile, once again, Russia militarily intervened in Syria at the request of the internationally recognized government in Damascus, defending Syria from a Western imperialist war to destroy and collapse a central state. Finally, I conclude this article here talking about intersectional imperialism because it's become very clear that this is the new strategy of the U.S. empire, trying to rebrand itself as progressive, trying to rebrand imperialism as progressive, as woke. And this is what you could call intersectional imperialism. Now, for people who don't know, intersectionality refers to the fact, it's true, that all forms of oppression are interlinked. Racism, sexism, homophobia, it's true, they are interlinked. But this idea, which is true, and which began on the left, has been cynically co-opted and exploited and distorted by the U.S. government. Of course, they never talk about class oppression. So they make everything about this neoliberal identity politics framing that sees you know, racism and misogyny against billionaire capitalists and Hillary Clinton, a war criminal. They make it seem like that's the same as the brutal exploitation of Latina women who have to be domestic workers in the United States because they can't get documents and they're treated horribly and their wages are stolen, or the brutal police violence against black men or something, and the brutal exploitation of poor people in the United States and homeless people. They, they always remove class from intersectionality and they remove imperialism from intersectionality. So the White House, especially, on, we've seen Democrats do this especially, We've seen that the Biden White House published a document claiming to follow a, quote, intersectional approach. We also saw Hillary Clinton during her campaign, during the primary, when she was running a right wing campaign against center left social Democrat Bernie Sanders. She was talking about intersectionality to attack the left. Once again, we see Secretary of State Anthony Blinken, a war criminal who supports apartheid Israel who supports the borderline genocidal war in Yemen, who supported the war in Syria and Libya, he has also been exploiting rhetoric of so-called intersectionality, claiming the State Department, which carries out war and imposes sanctions around the world, supposedly supports intersectionality. I also note that the CIA released an ad recently, you know, the so-called woke ad, with a Latina CIA agent talking about how she's a proud intersectional feminist. Here's a clip. I'm a woman of color, I am a mom, I am a cisgender millennial who's been diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder. I am intersectional. I stand here today a proud first-generation Latina and officer at CIA. And the CIA, which of course has carried out right-wing coups d'etat around the world and tortured people and assassinated left-wing leaders and tried to assassinate Fidel Castro more than 600 times, they even so cynically, they published an article in the Washington Blade, which is a major LGBT media outlet in DC, claiming that the CIA defends the trans community. It's so cynical. They're exploiting some of the most marginalized, oppressed people in the US and the world and trying to use that cynically to defend the US empire, the most murderous criminal institution on the planet. 
that has murdered people of color around the world and starved them. I mean, so criminal. I also note, I have an article and I did a video at Multipolarista about how the US government funds a podcast that was co-created and is co-hosted by a CIA veteran that claims to speak on behalf of the Uyghur diaspora. Now, the CIA veteran is a white guy. He has nothing to do with China. He's not Uyghur. And this CIA-backed, U.S. government-funded podcast claiming to speak on behalf of the Uyghur diaspora uses intersectional feminist rhetoric to attack China, claiming China is patriarchal, misogynist, and all this ridiculous nonsense. So, you know, I say here, I conclude the article noting that the U.S. strategy of intersectional imperialism shows how Washington has modified its propaganda tactics, employing progressive-sounding talking points to appeal to left-leaning youths in order to push right-wing policies. So the, the right-wing, you know, uh, so-called right-wing populist, I mean, those frauds, they're complete frauds, the ones who support imperialism and support capitalism, support oppression, they're claiming that now, you know, that the left is imperialist and, and wokeism and all. No, the U.S. government doesn't care about these progressive values. They don't care about supporting people of color and poor people and women and LGBT people. They're exploiting these talking points to try to recruit young people because they know young people are overwhelmingly progressive and left leaning to support their right wing neoliberal imperialist policies. This is not about genuine support for LGBT people and women and people of color. The U.S. empire is using LGBT people and people of color and women as cannon fodder, as human shields in its imperialist propaganda and its imperialist war on the entire world. It's, this, it's cynical and it's really disgusting considering the horrible forms of oppression that trans people face, that Latinos face, that black people in the U.S. face, that women face. I mean, look at Roe v. Wade being overturned. So it's completely cynical and ridiculous. And it's an example, as I conclude this article noting, of this nonsensical intersectional imperialism. And one of the best demonstrations of this is an award-winning academic paper that sounds like satire, but it is not satire. It is by a U.S. academic named Kara Daggett, who did her PhD at John Hopkins University, which is basically, you know, has a revolving door at the U.S. government. And in this insane article in the International Feminist Journal of Politics, she, it is titled, quote, Drone Disorientations, How Unmanned Weapons Queer the Experience of Killing in war. So she's whitewashing the U.S. drone assassination program by, by saying that it challenges heteronormativity by queering the act of killing, imperial murder, assassination. She writes, killing with drones produces queer moments of disorientation. I mean, the U.S. settler, settler colonial regime founded on the most massive genocide in human history against more than 100 million indigenous people. The U.S. colonial regime accusing Russia of colonialism and calling for decolonizing and breaking up Russia is another example of this insane hypocrisy. And it shows how U.S. imperialists continue to try to exploit and co-opt left-wing rhetoric to push right-wing imperialist policies. We need to call this out because the right-wing conservative frauds who claim to be populist and all this nonsense, who criticize wokeism and all that ridiculousness, they are not truly interested in helping people of color and poor people and LGBT people. They hate them. They're cynically engaged in a culture war on the other side of the culture war that the U.S. empire is waging. All they're doing is hurting people who are victims of patriarchy and capitalism and racism and actual colonialism and actual imperialism and the worst imperialist power on earth by far, by orders of magnitude, is 
the United States of America, and it has millions of victims of its imperialism around the world, and Washington trying to, to project its crimes onto Russia with this congressional briefing attended by an actual member of Congress talking about why Russia is not a real nation. It is the peak of cynicism.